James Connolly, Irish, Seamus the 5th of June 1868 to the 12th of May 1916, was an Irish Republican and socialist leader. He was a member of the Industrial Workers of the World and founder of the Irish Socialist Republican Party. With James Larkin, he was centrally involved in the Dublin lockout of 1913, as a result of which the two men formed the Irish Citizen Army ICA that year. He opposed British rule in Ireland, and was one of the leaders of the Easter Rising of 1916, when the ICA, along with the larger Irish volunteers, seized Dublin and held it for six days. Connolly was born in the Cowgate area of Edinburgh, Scotland, to Irish parents. He left school for working life at the age of 11, and became one of the leading Marxist theorists of his day. He also took a role in Scottish and American politics. He was executed by a British firing squad because of his leadership role in the Easter Rising. <laughs> Early life Connolly was born in an Irish immigrant slum in Edinburgh in 1868, the third son of John Connolly and Mary McGinn. His parents had moved to Scotland from County Monaghan, Ireland, and settled in the Cowgate, an Irish ghetto where thousands of Irish people lived. He spoke with a Scottish accent throughout his life. He was born in St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Parish, in the Cowgate district of Edinburgh known as Little Ireland. His father and grandfathers were labourers. He had an education up to the age of about 10 in the local Catholic primary school. He left and worked in labouring jobs. Owing to the economic difficulties he was having, like his eldest brother John, he joined the British Army. He enlisted at age 14, falsifying his age and giving his name as Reed, as his brother John had done. He served in Ireland with the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Scots Regiment for nearly seven years, during a turbulent period in rural areas known as the Land War. He would later become involved in the land issue. He developed a deep hatred for the British Army that lasted his entire life. When he heard that his regiment was being transferred to India, he deserted. Connolly had another reason for not wanting to go to India, a young woman by the name of Lily Reynolds. Lily moved to Scotland with James after he left the army and they married in April 1890. They settled in Edinburgh. There, Connolly began to get involved in the Scottish Socialist Federation, but with a young family to support, he needed a way to provide for them. He briefly established a cobbler's shop in 1895, but this failed after a few months as his shoe-mending skills were insufficient. He was strongly active with the socialist movement at the time, and prioritised this over his own work. <laughs> <laughs> socialist involvement He became secretary of the Scottish Socialist Federation. At the time his brother John was secretary, after John spoke at a rally in favour of the eight-hour day, however, he was fired from his job with the Edinburgh Corporation, so while he looked for work, James took over as secretary. During this time, Connolly became involved with the Independent Labour Party which Keir Hardy had formed in 1893. At some time during this period, he took up the study of, and advocated the use of, the neutral international language, Esperanto. By 1892 he was involved in the Scottish Socialist Federation, acting as its secretary from 1895. Two months after the birth of his third daughter, word came to Connolly that the Dublin Socialist Club was looking for a full-time secretary, a job that offered a salary of a pound a week. Connolly and his family moved to Dublin, where he took up the position. At his instigation, the club quickly evolved into the Irish Socialist Republican Party ISRP. The ISRP is regarded by many Irish historians as a party of pivotal importance in the early history of Irish socialism and republicanism. While active as a socialist in Great Britain, Connolly was the founding editor of the Socialist newspaper and was among the founders of the Socialist Labour Party which split from the Social Democratic Federation in 1903. Connolly joined Maud Gonne and Arthur Griffith in the Dublin protests against the Boer War. A combination of frustration with the progress of the ISRP and economic necessity caused him to emigrate to the United States in September 1903, with no plans as to what he would do there. While in America he was a member of the Socialist Labour Party of America 1906, the Socialist Party of America 1909, and the Industrial Workers of the World, and founded the Irish Socialist Federation in New York, 1907. He famously had a chapter of his 1910 book Labour in Irish History entitled, A Chapter of Horrors, Daniel O'Connell and the Working Class. 
critical of the achiever of Catholic emancipation 60 years earlier. On Connolly's return to Ireland in 1910, he was right hand man to James Larkin in the Irish Transport and General Workers' Union. He stood twice for the Woodkey Ward of Dublin Corporation but was unsuccessful. His name, and those of his family, appears in the 1911 Census of Ireland. His occupation is listed as National Organiser Socialist Party. In 1913, in response to the lockout, he, along with an ex-British officer, Jack White, founded the Irish Citizen Army ICA, an armed and well-trained body of labour men whose aim was to defend workers and strikers, particularly from the frequent brutality of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. Though they only numbered about 250 at most, their goal soon became the establishment of an independent and socialist Irish nation. He also founded the Irish Labour Party as the political wing of the Irish Trade Union Congress in 1912 and was a member of its national executive. Around this time he met Winifred Carney in Belfast, who became his secretary and would later accompany him during the Easter Rising. Like Vladimir Lenin, Connolly opposed the First World War explicitly from a socialist perspective. Rejecting the Redmondite position, he declared, I know of no foreign enemy of this country except the British government. Topic. Easter Rising Connolly stood aloof from the leadership of the Irish Volunteers. He considered them too bourgeois and unconcerned with Ireland's economic independence. In 1916, thinking they were merely posturing and unwilling to take decisive action against Britain, he attempted to goad them into action by threatening to send the ICA against the British Empire alone, if necessary. This alarmed the members of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, who had already infiltrated the volunteers and had plans for an insurrection that very year. In order to talk Connolly out of any such rash action, the IRB leaders, including Tom Clark and Patrick Pearce, met with Connolly to see if an agreement could be reached. During the meeting, the IRB and the ICA agreed to act together at Easter of that year. During the Easter Rising, beginning on 24 April 1916, Connolly was Commandant of the Dublin Brigade. As the Dublin Brigade had the most substantial role in the Rising, he was de facto Commander-in-Chief. Connolly's leadership in the Easter Rising was considered formidable. Michael Collins said of Connolly that he would have followed him through hell. Following the surrender, he said to other prisoners, don't worry. Those of us that signed the proclamation will be shot. But the rest of you will be set free. Topic. Death Connolly was not actually held in jail, but in a room now called the Connolly Room at the State Apartments in Dublin Castle, which had been converted to a first aid station for troops recovering from the war, Connolly was sentenced to death by firing squad for his part in the Rising. On 12 May 1916 he was taken by military ambulance to Royal Hospital Kilmainham, across the road from Kilmainham Jail, and from there taken to the jail, where he was to be executed. While Connolly was still in hospital in Dublin Castle, during a visit from his wife and daughter, he said, the socialists will not understand why I am here, they forget I am an Irishman. Connolly had been so badly injured from the fighting a doctor had already said he had no more than a day or two to live, but the execution order was still given that he was unable to stand before the firing squad, he was carried to a prison courtyard on a stretcher. His absolution and last rites were administered by a capuchin, Father Aloysius Travers. Asked to pray for the soldiers about to shoot him, he said, I will say a prayer for all men who do their duty according to their lights. Instead of being marched to the same spot where the others had been executed, at the far end of the execution yard, he was tied to a chair and then shot. His body, along with those of the other leaders, was put in a mass grave without a coffin. The executions of the rebel leaders deeply angered the majority of the Irish population, most of whom had shown no support during the rebellion. It was Connolly's execution that caused the most controversy. Historians have pointed to the manner of execution of Connolly and similar rebels, along with their actions, as being factors that caused public awareness of their desires and goals and gathered support for the movements that they had died fighting for. The executions were not well received, even throughout Britain, and drew unwanted attention from the United States, which the British government was seeking to bring into the war in Europe. H. H. Asquith, the Prime Minister, ordered that no more executions were to take place, an exception being that of Roger Casement, who was charged with high treason and had not yet been tried.
Topic: Family. James Connolly and his wife Lily had six children. Nora became an influential writer and campaigner within the Irish Republican movement as an adult. Roddy continued his father's politics. In later years, both became members of the Oireachtas Irish Parliament. Moira became a doctor and married Richard Beach. One of Connolly's daughters Mona died in 1904 aged 13, when she burned herself while she did the washing for an aunt. Three months after James Connolly's execution his wife was received into the Catholic Church, at Church Street on 15 August. Topic. Legacy Connolly's legacy in Ireland is mainly due to his contribution to the Republican cause. His legacy as a socialist has been claimed by a variety of left wing and left Republican groups, and he is also associated with the Labour Party which he founded. Connolly was among the few European members of the Second International who opposed, outright, World War I. This put him at odds with most of the socialist leaders of Europe. He was influenced by and heavily involved with the radical industrial workers of the World Labour Union, and envisaged socialism as industrial union control of production. Also he envisioned the IWW forming their own political party that would bring together the feuding socialist groups such as the Socialist Labour Party of America and the Socialist Party of America. Likewise, he envisaged independent Ireland as a socialist republic. His connection and views on revolutionary unionism and syndicalism have raised debate on if his image for a workers' republic would be one of state or grassroots socialism. For a time he was involved with de Leonism and the Second International until he later broke with both. In Scotland, Connolly's thinking influenced socialists such as John MacLean, who would, like him, combine his leftist thinking with nationalist ideas when he formed the Scottish Workers' Republican Party. The Connolly Association, a British organisation campaigning for Irish unity and independence, is named after Connolly. There is a statue of James Connolly in Dublin, outside Liberty Hall, the offices of the SIP2 trade union. Another statue of Connolly stands in Union Park, Chicago near the offices of the UE Union. There is a bust of Connolly in Troy, New York, in the park behind the statue of Uncle Sam. In March 2016 a statue of Connolly was unveiled by Northern Ireland Minister Karel Nichulín, and Connolly's great-grandson, James Connolly Heron, on Falls Road in Belfast. In a 1972 interview on The Dick Cavett Show, John Lennon stated that James Connolly was an inspiration for his song, Woman is the Nigger of the World. Lennon quoted Connolly's The Female is the Slave of the Slave in explaining the feminist inspiration for the song, Connolly Station, one of the two main railway stations in Dublin, and Connolly Hospital, Blanchardstown, are named in his honour. In a 2002, BBC television production, 100 Greatest Britons where the British public were asked to register their vote, Connolly was voted in 64th place. In 1968, Irish group The Wolf Tones released a single named, James Connolly which reached number 15 in the Irish charts. The band Black 47 wrote and performed a song about Connolly that appears on their album Fire of Freedom. Irish singer-songwriter Niall Connolly has a song, May 12, 1916 A Song for James Connolly, on his album Dream Your Way Out of This One, 2017. Dunedin Connolly Gack, a Scottish GAA club takes its name from his Topic. See also James Connolly bibliography <laughs> <laughs> Notes <laughs>